apparently my daughter's too young to need the electric scooter. So, short backstory. My daughter, 16, has MS. It's taken a lot from her, including her balance and vision in one eye. She can walk with her walker, but we're only up to about 250 feet. Definitely not far enough to make it through a big box store trip. So she uses the electric carts. Okay, so y'all know where this is going. Here we are, walking slash riding, doing our shopping. When an older gentleman walks up and tells my kiddo she needs to get up and let people who need the carts to use them. I kind of smile, trying not to let this go left, but the mama hairs were rising. He then raises his voice and says she's young and lazy, so she should give the cart to someone else. I went back and forth in my head for a second on how to deal with this before I finally was like, you know what? Key Caregiver Jr., walk up and walk over to the kind man. She laughs and does that. Without a better way to describe it, when she walks, she looks like someone who's had seven shots too many. I then help her back into the cart. And my kid being my kid looks him in the eyes and slightly raises her voice and tells him, and see boys and girls, this is why we don't judge a book by its cover. What's up guys? Welcome back to Storytime with Uncle John. Today we are taking a look at Entitled People. I gotta say, it's pretty rare that I've ever encountered anybody that ballsy on the Entitled side of the camp um, out in public. I've heard the stories and I've heard stories, you know, personal accounts from other people, still anecdotal. Um, but every so often you can, you can spot somebody and you can hear little mumbles and grumbles as they walk around the store. You can see the looks on their faces and you can almost, you can almost tell which ones would actually say that kind of stuff out loud without ever thinking twice about it. Now I got to say, even if this kid 16, 12, nine, I don't give a rat's behind. Even if this kid was able-bodied enough, had zero medical history and was perfectly fine to walk around and this kid was in a cart. A, you don't know that. You don't know them unless you know the family personally, but out and mind your own business. That's between the parents, the child, the store, and their maker. It's got nothing to do with you. If you need a cart, you go to the store and you tell them, you know, you guys are all out of electric carts. What do I do? I know they're here for a courtesy for us who may need them, but there are none available and I really need one. Uh, then that's up to the store to figure out what to do next. Maybe you know, round one up, maybe one got left in the lot somewhere. Who knows? There are times in life when you need to speak up and stand up for other people. And there are times when you need to keep your mouth shut because you're, you'll honestly pick up on more around you, your surroundings. You'll be more situationally aware, let's say, if you tend to be faster to listen, keep your mouth shut, and observe. And usually within a couple seconds, maybe even a minute, I'll give you a minute you can usually tell if that person actually needs that card or not, or, you know, some specialty device or whatever, some accommodation. Those that are fastest to open their mouth and that, 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 they know the least and are usually uh, the most wrong. I spent $10,000 here. These three fat dudes have been trouble at my store, but it was my first time dealing with them. A few days ago, the main guy was yelling at our head cashier for no reason. She was only present to open the bullpen, and he was yelling about how he needs to get these Trex boards, how he spends 10 k and whatnot. I came back from break, and he was being assisted already by one of our pros. The customer told the pro a certain ASM would give him 15% off. So he asked another ASM, and they said they can try to do 10. The pro isn't trying to risk his job. The customer came to my register saying that he's supposed to get a competitor discount. I say, what's the discount for? The customer says it's competitor pricing. Like, what the F does that even mean? Our direct competitor? I say, like, what is it for? Customer says, it's what the manager gives me. Of course I would need to get a manager override. I call my supervisor and tell her, and she's just as confused as me, because if it's truly a competitor, he would have the price to match from an actual competitor. The customer starts getting mad, so I just ask if she can come to deal with this F. <laughs> the customer starts getting mad, so I just ask if she can come deal with this fat F. Supervisor says, so I'm not going to give that discount since I wasn't aware or ever told about this. That particular manager's been on vacation for a month now, but I'll call the ASM we have currently. The ASM was called, never showed up, and the guy was getting pissed saying how he has places to be and how he spent 10 k Like, dude, I don't give enough. Customer says, can't you just put in military? I was thinking to myself, what? We don't just give military discounts for free to people. The pro that was originally assisting was noticing things were heating up, so he just put his military in to get this guy gone. You can't just spend money and demand discounts. We have a guy who spends close to a million and is a lot more chill than this clown. I'll never understand why people assume that if they spend a certain amount of money, they are owed a discount. First of all, if you 
feel the need or want to work a deal like that, you need to talk to somebody ahead of time, set up some sort of special account, special password, special whatever. There's always a way. You know, when I used to work with mom and pop lumber companies to get materials and goods out to the job site, we ordered a lot of material. And I mean more than the average builder. And we would always get a discount. It's something that we worked out with the salespeople and the owner of the company before things ever got rolling, or at least once we got we got moving, but you know, they realized we were going to be ordering a lot from them. Not only were they willing to give us the discount, but it, it really wasn't any problem. It just needed to be worked out ahead of time. This guy probably never spent even $1,000 a year, let alone 10 k a month or whatever it said. Most of those guys are just total, you know, like I said, blowhards, and they really have no basis in reality. They just think they're more important and can bully people into doing what they want. The point I was trying to make a second ago is if that lumber company decided that, you know, our discount was going to be a lower percentage, or maybe they did away with the discount because they changed owners or something, fine, so be it. We either keep ordering lumber with them or we go try to order and, you know, make a deal with some other company. Uh, you don't usually try to, you try usually not to cut off your nose to spite your face though. You know, you try to work things out and see what you can do to balance things out, to make things worthwhile for everybody. You know, in most cases for the smaller lumber companies and even Home Depot, if you order above a certain dollar amount of lumber from Home Depot, Lowe's, and I think Maynard's, Menard's, uh, something like that, usually they have a pre- a pre-done discount, like 10% if you order over this much. And I think if you order like a truckload of lumber, like, I mean, a tractor trailer load of lumber, they'll give you like 20% because it's, it's a quick sale for them. It's quick, easy cash. There was less handling of the materials and things like that. So it was definitely worth their while to give some kind of discount, but never, ever assume that you're owed one ever. Friend tells me how to save money, but then wants me to buy them stuff. Hi, I let my friend move in because they had nowhere else to go. This is a lot on me because I should have talked more about what I expected. I'm okay with helping them out, but I feel like they just expect me to bankroll them. I've bought a lot of stuff because they told me we need it. A lot of it, yes, comes in handy, but we could do without it. I ask them what they want when I make my grocery order, and so my bill is more than twice what it was when it was just me. But they go and order DoorDash all the time. But they say they don't have money to help out with expenses. I am so broke and my car payment is past due and they're telling me they don't suggest things for me to do. They basically just tell me this is what you have to do. Tonight they told me to get cheaper car insurance to save money. They also told me we need an expensive tool. Well, they went to start a furniture flipping business and they would need this tool for that. And they also said they're saving all their money to buy a truck because they need that for the furniture flipping business they haven't even started yet. They work freelance and they had told me they were paying $350 a month rent in the place they were before, so I thought they would at least be able to contribute a little. They've bought furniture because they say we need it. But again, while it's important to have, what's important right now is being able to pay the bills and that should come before anything else. I have a full-time, very high-stress job and we're very short-handed right now. I suck at setting boundaries and this whole situation is horrible for my mental health. I just want them gone, but they have nowhere to go. I'm afraid to try to talk to them. There have already been several things in my house that broke or aren't working since they've been here. I don't think it's on purpose, but they aren't gentle and don't seem to have respect for my stuff. I feel like they think I'm just going to sacrifice everything else to buy them the stuff they want because they think they deserve my money and deserve to tell me what I should buy for my house or for them instead of letting me decide for myself. Oof. Bad situation. I don't like confrontation any more than the next guy, gal, whoever. But there comes a time. There is a line in the sand, so to speak. That's sort of a peeling back the onion layers kind of statement. But anyway, there is a line. And when people cross that line... It's time to either set it straight or you got to go. I'm not going to get into your business of what you're spending your money on if you're under my roof. That is your business. What is my business is what you're not contributing to the household. And if you live under this roof, you're sharing the expenses of the roof itself. You know, the, the, the apartment, the townhouse, the house, the cardboard box, whatever. The electricity, the utilities, if you pay for water consumption, sewer, whatever. You are paying part of that because you live here and you utilize those services. Now, I'm not expecting you to pay an equal share necessarily because A, you may be destitute and need help, but you got to help where you can. You're eating the food, you help pay for food. If you're ordering all DoorDash, that's on you because it's way too expensive to keep doing over and over. 
But at the same time, you know, you got to you got to help me out with what this living situation is. Otherwise, what's the point? You want to start a business? Great. Buy a piece of furniture, flip a piece of furniture and do the best you can with the tools you have at hand. Make a few bucks. You're not going to make as much as you would if you had, you know, had the professional tools or whatever or the space. Um, and then, you know, build on that. You know, use that money to help with the household and then take whatever's extra and go put it towards another tool and to get a little better each piece and make a little bit more on each piece. It takes time. It takes patience. I mean, hell, I'm still using one of the original microphones that I've had since the beginning of this whole channel. And honestly, it's like a $40 microphone on Amazon. Now, this one is a vintage one. This is a this is an older stage mic. But it works perfect for what I'm doing here. And the guts are almost exactly identical. You know, you see the, the Joe Rogan podcasts and all those other fancy podcasts with their, with their uh, I don't even remember which mic it is now. But anyway, you've seen the mics. They're the, the almost totally cylindrical microphones. The only thing that's really different from them versus this, there's a little bit of an electronic difference, but not much. Not enough to make a big difference. It's the way, they, uh, it's the way their capsules are encased. And there's a built-in windscreen that's much taller. Now, I've learned to control myself a lot around the microphone and not, you know, speak directly to it. It's called learning to work with what you have. And, you know, most of the time you don't really need anything better. Would it be nice to have one of those fancy dancy microphones? Sure. But why buy it when I don't need it? Would it be better to have a fancy camera? Probably in the future. But for right now, this webcam works fine for what I need and it does the job. I'm better off trying to work on my skills, which I still suck at a lot of things. <laughs> so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but we're getting there and I get more comfortable with this whole deal every day. So anyway, the point is you got to pay something. Nothing in life is free. And for the OP, you really need to, how do I say this gently? You really need to stand up for yourself and do what's right for you. If this person is basically a metaphorical boat anchor and, you know, causing you to have late car payments, late rent payments, whatever, and it's putting you in jeopardy of losing your livelihood in any way, shape or form, they either got to step it up now or they got to go. You're just going to have to learn. That's part of life is setting your boundaries and making them stick, even if it's late. Just because you didn't say it in the beginning doesn't mean you can't say it now. Woman stops in the middle of the road and pulls out a and honked at. Oh, dear. To preface this, it's my father's story and it happened a few years ago. My father was driving home on a one-lane road that had several roundabouts. At the time, the roundabouts were still being developed. Halfway around one of the roundabouts, a lady in the car in front of my dad stopped, blocking the entire road. Apparently, she was speaking with someone on the phone. My dad honked at her to move and she flipped him off in response. As such, he honked again and yelled at her. Dad says, move your car, B. The lady proceeded to pull out a pistol. I don't remember the exact model, but it was bright pink and on the smaller side. She waved it out the window at him. Oh, God. One thing about my dad is that he lives in a Second Amendment state and owns several registered firearms. He proceeded to pull out a 9mm and yell, Mine's bigger. Suddenly, the lady didn't want to talk on the phone anymore. She sped off, never to be seen again. Whenever he tells this story, he loves to end it off by saying, That's the first time I got to tell a woman that mine's bigger. Listen, I don't know if you know this about me, but I am... 100% all the way in support of 2A. There shouldn't be any doubt in anybody's mind. But with rights comes responsibilities. One of those is knowing the laws, the current laws. Whether you agree with the laws or not, we still need to follow the laws. If you're willing to break them and take the consequences, more power to you. You know what the consequences are or you should know. Sadly, most people don't study enough to actually know. They just grab it and go. They do their waiting period or whatever's required, put down their cash, and then, you know, start carrying like, like an idiot. That'd be like taking my kids, as soon as they turn 15 and a half, 16, whatever the laws are in your state. Actually, Jersey used to be 17. I don't know what it is these days. But anyway, and throwing them behind the wheel of a car, you know, no lessons, no nothing. Just, hey, have at it. Just, you know, point and shoot. <laughs> you know, it's dumb. And the same goes for 2A. If you're going to take on the challenge of carrying concealed, open, whatever your state requirements are, you have to know the consequences. There are repercussions. There are laws. There are guidelines. It's just like anything in life. There's rules. And even without the rules, there's common sense. Even back in the Wild West, which wasn't as wild as most movies portray, but anyway, 
you know, people didn't just brandish for the sake of brandishing because there's always somebody who's either got a bigger one, they're faster, <laughs> or there's more of them. So no matter what, there's always going to be somebody that can outdo you in one way, shape, or form. Don't start brandishing. This guy, I don't know if I would have said that out the window in response because, you know, I don't, I don't like to advertise if I have something or don't have something. I want to keep people guessing no matter what. There is a time when you pull out the tools that are needed for the job at hand. I'm trying to be delicate with the way I describe this because the YouTube gods sometimes are a little finicky. Listen, there are some occasions when it's proper to pull out the tools you need to take care of a situation at hand. There are, however, many, many, many more times when it's not proper, <laughs> not safe, not just not called for at all. To And this is one of them. Somebody's yelling at you. Who cares? Even if you weren't the one that started this situation by stopping in the middle of a roundabout intersection, street, whatever, and block traffic, even if you were the guy, if he had brandished his, that's not proper. It's not warranted. It's not called for. Your life was not in danger. While I'm all for people exercising their rights, I really don't believe there are a lot of people who have enough common sense to actually do that. But, you know, rights are rights, and I just have to be aware that there are idiots among us. She friendzoned me and got mad at me for blocking her afterwards. About three years ago, I, 25 male, had feelings for a girl we'll call Megan. She, 22 female, was nerdy, into anime, and played a lot of video games. It was those traits that made me interested in her, since I was also an anime lover and gamer. Over time, that interest turned into genuine attraction. At first, I was hesitant about asking her out because I wasn't sure if she felt the same, but after some encouragement from my friends, I made my move. We met up at a local diner for lunch. The diner was one of those mom and pop places and the food was really good. As we're eating, I finally decided to tell her how I felt. Again, I was hesitant about doing so, but went through with it anyway. She seemed receptive at first, and she asked me what it was about her that made me interested in her, so I listed a few things. Her interest in anime, her taste in video games, her dark sense of humor, things like that. I didn't want to ask her to be my girlfriend right then and there, so instead, I asked if she would be up for getting to know each other more and maybe going on an actual date or two to see where things go from there. She then goes on to apologize and say that she does like me, but only as a friend. She said that she didn't want to ruin our friendship and that she didn't want there to be any bad feelings if we did get together but broke up. Hearing that hurt a bit. Part of me wanted to at least try to convince her to change her mind, but the only words that came out of my mouth were, okay, I'm fine with that. We chatted for a little while longer before we left the diner and went out our separate ways. I tried to reach out a few times after that day to see how she was doing, but I was either left on red or read or read. How do you say that? I, I call it left on red because she read the notification. I don't know. Or met with one word replies. So after a while, I stopped reaching out. Fast forward about two months, I finally met someone new. We'll call her Sophie. Sophie, 24, was into art and photography. In her own words, she told stories with her art. Whatever piqued her interest wound up as a painting or a sculpture or a framed photograph. She was really good at it after a while. Those same feelings from months before started to come back. What I didn't expect was for her to feel the same way. I asked her to go on a date with me and she said yes. Date nights became a regular thing until eventually we made things official. After our seventh date, I asked her if she would like to be my girlfriend and she said yes. The next day when I told my friends about it, they were stoked since they were the ones that pushed me to move on and not let my rejection from months ago bother me. A week later, I'm sitting in my room reading a book when I get a messenger notification. I look and see that it's from Megan. I thought that it was kind of weird considering the fact she hadn't spoken to me in months. Out of curiosity, I opened the message. Her message was basically a short paragraph talking about how after having some time to think, she decided that she actually did want to be my girlfriend. Oh my god. Her message said that she always had feelings for me and that she was ready to give us a chance. Now things started to look even more weird. I mean, really? After all this time, all the one word of replies and unread messages, now she has feelings? I took a screenshot of her message and sent it to Sophie. After that, I blocked Megan and thought that was the end of it. About two days later, Megan shows up to my house and she's extremely upset. As I open the door, she starts ripping me a new one, telling me how horrible I am for blocking her after she confessed her feelings for me. I told her that she has no right to be upset about anything, considering the fact that she was the one who rejected me and said that we would never be a thing. She then tries to guilt trip me, asking me if her feelings for me meant anything. I then said, where were those feelings when I was single? I told her that she doesn't get to switch up now that she sees me with someone else and then get upset at me for not going along with it. I told her to have a nice day and then shut the door. 
Our friend group is divided on this, and I'm starting to question if I did the right thing or not. I was just a bit upset. I felt like she expected me to just ditch my girlfriend for her just because she changed her mind. What do you guys think? First of all, OP, I want to say good for you. You stand up for yourself. Too many, and I, and I was guilty of this in the past too when I was younger, too many of us will take the rejection, take the being ignored for months on end, and then when they turn on the switch and say, oh, I want you after all, then all of a sudden we're all giddy about it and we're excited because it's something we wanted before. You actually realized right up front that this was no good. The only reason she wanted you is because she couldn't have you and you had someone else. And I guarantee that's it. And I have a hard time with these friend groups. I'm a little leery of them. Uh, some of my kids have certain friend groups and things get a little weird. And they did when I was that age too. I'm not going to say we didn't. We just didn't have the social media to kind of fuel the flames as it were. Um, so anyway, I think social media these days just makes things weirder faster. It becomes weird more efficiently. Let's put it that way. But, uh, you know, your friend group may be divided and it may be time for you to start moving on. Stay friends with those who are not bashing you for your decisions and uh, the rest of them, maybe it's time to let them go. And if that means you're not part of the friend group anymore, so be it. You got to live your life. You know, I never understood why people thought that they could control other people by guilting them into things or, you know, browbeating them, whatever the case may be. Coming from someone who had many, many rejections, you know, coming up as a teenager and young adult, I can truly say that for the most part, I kept myself out of trouble and didn't let myself fall for the old, you know, well, now that I can't have you or now that you have this girlfriend, you know, now I want to be your girlfriend. No, 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 no. Thank you anyway. Appreciate the thought, but you know, not only did you reject me, which I could, I could almost handle the rejection and staying friends. That doesn't always work out well. In fact, it probably rarely works out well, but anyway, I could handle that part. The part I can handle is after you say you want to remain friends and then you ghost me for months on end. Nah, I don't give a rat's ass if I was trying to be your boyfriend or not. If my best fishing buddy was like that and started ghosting me for months without some good reason, you know, some turmoil in his life or something like that, I'm not going to rag on him about it, but I damn sure don't need to be in your conversations. If I'm not important enough to have a conversation with, you know, every so often, the, hey, how you doing, you know, check in kind of thing, then, you know, it's not important enough to have a friendship. So there's that. Never be afraid to be alone. Does that make sense? I think it does. Anyway, I'm nuts. What do I know? A Karen in the Wild at PHL. Must be Philadelphia. Context. I have a non-cancerous eye tumor. I was diagnosed in 2016, and for the first few years, I had to travel to Willis Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. Nailed it. To get it measured and make sure it wasn't growing or changing. My 82-year-old mom was with me. This happened when mom and I were returning to Florida. Philadelphia is our hometown and we love traveling there. Hoagies, cheesesteaks, soft pretzels, Italian ice, breakfast at the Dutch Kitchen at Reading Terminal Market, ice cream at Bassett's, fresh fruit and veggies from Le Lovin Brothers? Thought it was Levine Brothers. I don't know. Anyway, yummy, but I digress. Mom and I got to Philadelphia Airport with plenty of time to spare for our flight, two plus hours. We went through TSA and got to our gate. My carry-on was a bag of food, pretzels for dad, a leftover roasted cinnamon bun from Dutch Kitchen, Goldenberg's peanut chews, all of our favorites. We get to our gate and there's no one there. It's just her and I. We choose three seats at the front of the seating area for our gate. Front row center, baby. Mom and I sit down with the bag of snacks on the seat between us. Again, there's not another soul in the gate area, not even a gate agent at this time. Mom says, basically, gotta go to the ladies room, be right back, and takes off. I'm playing on my phone, reading the news, whatever. When along comes a Karen in the wild and she sits down on my mother's seat. I look over, see it's not my mom, and say, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, my mom is sitting there. She makes a big, exaggerated show of looking around and says, well, I sure don't see her. I said, she ran to the ladies' room, but she'll be right back. Karen rolls her eyes at me and says, fine, I'll sit there, and points to the seat that's housing our precious cargo. At that point, I literally laughed out loud. I said, no, you are not sitting in the seat between me and my 82-year-old mother. There are plenty of other seats around here. You do not need to have any of these three that we're seated in. To which Karen says, I'll speak to the gate agent about this. And then stalks off and finds a gate agent at another gate. Karen brings her back to our gate. Karen tried to bring her over to me, but the agent stayed in the podium. 
I couldn't hear what was being said, but Karen was gesticulating wildly, and I could see the gate agent giving her the palms down, calm down sign. I had no idea what was said, but Karen ended up coming back over and sitting in the seat directly behind me. I laughed again. Mom comes back and I'm still laughing. She asked me what was so funny. So without lowering my voice even a little bit, your reliable narrator was not going Soto voice for this one. Soto? Sato? I don't know. Tell me what that is down below. I told my mom the whole story, laughing while I'm telling it and making no show whatsoever that I care that this woman is sitting right behind me. I don't know if she felt shamed or what, but she did end up moving to another row where she couldn't hear me telling my mom about what an idiot she was. Mom's like, what's going on? I'm like, pointing my thumb over my shoulder. See this one? She tried to take your seat. So mom and I have a nice conversation about what a lunatic she was. I'd move seats too. Interesting note, when the flight was boarding, we saw that Karen had, somehow or another, sucked up to someone in a wheelchair and was getting early boarding. She claimed to the gate agents that she was this person's assistant. Seems like Karen wanted our seats to get some kind of early boarding. This was Southwest. At the time, and I haven't flown since this trip, it was group boarding. Karen must have had, like, Group C. Poor little snowflake. Alright, so let me start off with, I absolutely love Philadelphia cheesesteaks. Now, in the grand scheme of things, they really aren't anything that special to me. They are made with Cheese Whiz, the good ones. And Cheese Whiz is not really all that good for you, but it really is good on a hot sandwich. All melty and gooey and messy and yeah. Philadelphia soft pretzels, love the soft pretzels, but 90% of the time when you get them, they're from a roadside vendor and they're cold. Uh, that's no fun, but you know, they still taste good. Some of the other stuff, not too sure about. Haven't been to Reading Market in forever, so I don't even know what's there anymore. Not too long after I got out of the service, we built a nightclub in downtown Philadelphia uh, along Delaware Avenue, along the waterfront. It was a section of warehouse that had been torn down years ago. There was an interior nightclub called the Aztec Club, and uh, it was mostly on the second floor. So you had to come up some stairs after you, you know, pass the door guys and all that stuff. And then they had a balcony out on the outside of the building that was left. And uh, we built an outdoor nightclub for the same owners called Kokomo Bay Cafe. Guy really had a thing for the Beach Boys. Anyway, um, you know, it had it had a catwalk coming off the second floor balcony down to a mountain and then around the corner to another mountain, which was sort of a volcano type deal. Uh, it had gas lines sticking out the top where, you know, the DJ could shoot flames up in the air and a waterfall coming off the front of it, right in front of a tiki bar that was de right dead center. That was like the, the centerpiece. And uh, we had a blast building this place. But anyway, food. Johnny's Hot Sausages. Now, I don't, some people call it Johnny Pollock's. I don't think so. I think this was another, I think this was a little independent guy. But there was a dock around the corner where all the city uh, trash trucks and, you know, solid waste trucks would go to load their stuff on the barges. And right in front of the gate to this place was this little shack. It couldn't have been more than 10 by 20 uh, with a roll up door in the front from the countertop. And this guy was open. He started at like four 30 in the morning cooking sausages and people would eat those things, including me for breakfast, lunch, and dinner on this job site. They weren't super expensive. They were filling. You could get mild. You could get spicy. What, you know, 8 million toppings loved it. I keep wanting to go back there and see if the place is still there, but I don't get to Philly. When do I go to Philly? And, you know, even if I'm going to the airport, I'm not hanging around. And the airport's nowhere close to Delaware Avenue. So anyway, yeah, I've seen a lot of people like this on different flights before where they think they're special somehow. You know, you have group C and you think somehow you're going to walk in with group A or military or disabled passengers. And that's just not how any of this works. And who cares? The plane's not flying out any faster because you got on faster. So I don't understand the hurry. If I miss my group and I got to wait till the end, so be it. It's not pleasant and I feel like I'm holding the works up. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it takes me like two seconds to throw my crap in the overhead or under my seat and sit down, buckle in and we off we go. You know, it's, it's not a big deal. Usually it takes longer to get clearance to pull out from the gate and taxi out to the runway than it does for anything else. So, you know, there's a lot of hurry up and wait. But people like that just kill me, you know. They think they can just come up and invade your space. And, you know, while I can understand the first mistake about sitting in your mom's seat, it's not like you can actually reserve seats in place like this. You know, if it was a dining table in a restaurant, maybe that's different. But, you know, at the same time, if there was a lot of other empty seats, the lady should have just got up and moved. Would have taken like two seconds. Flying. Ugh. One of my least favorite things to do outside of painting, which we're 
working on this house, painting a ton. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed today's stories. And if you did, do me a favor, click all the little buttons down below, share with your friends, blah, blah, blah. Listen, I usually don't ask, but I'd really like more of you guys to subscribe only because I had this little OCD thing in my brain. We're getting really close to 10,000 subscribers. And I don't know that subscribers really mean much for most channels these days because of the way YouTube just keeps screwing with everything. But it, it would really make my Christmas if we could get over the 10,000 subscriber mark. So if you could help me out with that, I'd be eternally grateful. All right. Till the next one, guys. We'll see you.